Well, good morning to all of you who are watching online today. As you know, we have canceled our church events for this week due to the concerns regarding COVID-19. And hopefully our participation in canceling is going to actually lessen the impact of possible community spread of this virus. Uh, as you know, our state government officials have asked for us to do so, and, and we've decided to cooperate. And by the way, our president has declared today to be a day of prayer. And so please, although we're always prayerful, uh, let's pray specifically that the threat of this new virus will pass quickly and we can soon meet once again together. I really do miss all of you. I really do. I truly feel a loss because, you know, church is more than just hearing a preacher expound upon the word. It's about the body of Christ coming together in fellowship and in worship. And, you know, today I'm actually doing something I've never done before. This is the first time. I've preached to uh, groups of a few thousand, but this is a first for me today. I'm preaching to a congregation of just one person, uh, our cameraman. And so thanks, Will Moncrief, for running camera today and coming in and doing this. Anyways, let's open to the sixth chapter of Matthew's Gospel this morning. This is Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 18. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. For they disfigure their faces to show men that they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for these words of yours spoken on the banks of the Sea of Galilee thousands of years ago. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to what you're saying to us through this passage. Lord, that we would take it and become doers of your word and not hearers only. And we ask all this in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, before we begin to study these verses this morning, I want us first to have an understanding of the context of what we are going to study. We need to be aware of the surrounding verses and paragraphs so that we will better understand the setting in which these words were first spoken. And we also need to be aware that one of the best ways to study Scripture is by interpreting Scripture in light of other Scripture. The Apostle Paul expressed this, this, this importance when he told us that, the whole, that we're to study and consider the whole counsel of God. In other words, the whole Bible relating one passage to another. That's how you study Scripture. And so in light of this principle, I want you to be wary of anyone who would take just one piece of Scripture and try to create, try to build a doctrine or teaching around that one verse. Because if we take a single verse and we pull it away from its context, then we can practically make it say anything that we want it to. We can make it mean anything that we desire. Because, you see, we will then be forcing it to accept the meaning that we seek to overlay upon it. And yet, you know, unfortunately, some preachers do this. 
And possibly you've tried to do this in your own personal times of Bible reading. I, I know some people are tempted to do that. And, and some people can even go to an extreme on this one. Some people, uh, sometimes trying to be super spiritual, will try the hunt and seek method of Bible study. Believing that you can simply flop open your Bible and whatever it, wherever it opens, at that moment, that is God's word for you. That somehow God is going to send you a message by randomly landing on a certain piece of scripture as you open your Bible. And you know, I've tried that when I was a new Christian, and it can be exciting, really just taking the Bible, opening it up, letting it fall to, to, to one of the pages, and finding a verse that really speaks to your heart. It can be very exciting, unless you hit the wrong verse of scripture. Uh, for example, there's a story about a lady who tried that one morning for her daily devotion. She flopped open her Bible in her lap, closed her eyes, took her pointer finger, landed it on the page. And when she opened her eyes, she looked where her finger had landed. And it was Matthew 27 and verse 5, which says, So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. Well, she thought, hey, certainly that verse doesn't have anything to do with me. It doesn't make any sense. It didn't apply to her situation. And so she, she tried it again. I'll try it again. She closed her eyes, flopped open her Bible, took her pointer finger out. When she opened her eyes, she read out of Luke's gospel this time. The Bible had opened to Luke chapter 10, verse 37. And this is what it said. It said, then Jesus said, go and do thou likewise. So again, she realized that has no application for her life and neither of these two passages. So she decided to give it one more try. Again, she closed her eyes, flopped the Bible open, pointed to the word, opened her eyes. And this time she found herself in the Old Testament. It was Judges chapter 18 and verse 9, which said, aren't you going to do something? Do not hesitate. And so you see, we need to be careful. We need to read the word with an understanding of the context in which it was written. And with an understanding that the word of God that we're reading today was at one time, it was first of all the word of God to someone else a couple thousand years ago. Our Bible was God's word to other people before it came, became God's word to us. And so I want you to know that this portion that we're reading today is part of a larger whole. In fact, the, the fifth, sixth, and seventh chapters of Matthew are a written record of one discourse or sermon given by Jesus. All of it together is what we call the Sermon on the Mount because of its location on a slope of land that went down into the Sea of Galilee. And although we've taken a couple weeks now, uh, to study chapter 5, and, and I will yet take another week <clears throat> to study chapter 7. Today we're focusing on chapter 6. None of this was broken up when first presented because it was part of one entire sermon from the Lord Jesus Christ. So I've said all that to say this. There is a central theme in the middle of these three chapters. And I believe that the one single verse that sums up the overall theme is found in Matthew chapter 5. Verse 20, and this is a summary verse for all that Jesus speaks in this sermon. In Matthew 5, 20, he says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. And you see, all that Jesus says, everything that he tells us hinges upon that one verse, this single theme. There is to be a comparison of our righteousness, the righteousness of his hearers on the hillside that day, compared to the superficiality of the Pharisees. And that's the point of his sermon. I mean, Jesus could have given this sermon a title. Again, we have called it, our, our Bible scholars have labeled this portion of scripture as a sermon on the mount. But I think Jesus could have given it a different name. I think he could have called this sermon, Don't Be a Pharisee. Don't Be a Pharisee. Now, let's look at some of what we read in Matthew chapter 6. And it'll make it more clear why I've chosen that title. Uh, it'll make more sense because we'll have our bearings. We'll have our context. For example, Matthew 6, 2 says, When you give to the needy, Jesus said, do not do it the way the Pharisees do it. Or there's Matthew 6, 5. Jesus said, when you pray, don't pray like the Pharisees. And Matthew 6, 16, when you fast, do not do it the way that the Pharisees do it. You see, these are very direct sermon illustrations that Jesus is using here. He's trying to explain to us what he means by the righteousness of the Pharisees. And he's trying to explain to these people, and then to us today, exactly how we can be more righteous than these carnal and pseudo-spiritual teachers. Now, let's look at the Pharisees for a moment. What were they like? 
What were the Pharisees like? Well, according to Jesus, they looked good. They looked good. They were religious professionals. They knew the scriptures. They behaved appropriately in public. They displayed a public lifestyle of religiosity. To some degree, they exemplified before the public, at least before the public, how to give, how to pray, and of course, the habit of fasting. And they knew how to do all the right things at just the right time. But let me suggest something to you. The Gospels make it clear that doing all the right things will never impress God. We cannot touch the heart of God through deeds or works. Now, works can be an extension of faith. That's true. Valid works come out of a heart that has a real faith in God. For example, Ephesians 2.10, Paul said, For we are God's workmanship, every one of us, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. So works are part of it. James said the faith without works is dead. And so deeds and works should be the natural result. They should be the natural outflow of the faith that we have. But works alone, deeds which are publicly visible, do not necessarily prove that faith is at their core. You see, for the Pharisees, their faith wasn't in Christ. It wasn't in God. Their faith was in their deeds. They found their righteousness in the deeds, the, the deeds themselves. And that's why Jesus says they have received their reward in full. They have pay, they've been paid up, and that's all they're going to receive. Nothing beyond that. And so you see, we can't put our trust. We cannot put our trust in faith and in, in, in deeds and works. Now, the next chapter, chapter 7 of Matthew, is still part of this sermon that Jesus was, was giving that day. There's some very strong words for us, and I'm just going to read three verses. This is Matthew 7, verse 21, 22, and 23. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Look at, look at that message. This, again, this is all part of the Sermon on the Mount or don't be like a Pharisee. Look at this message. Jesus says, I don't care what you did for me. I don't care that you did miracles. I don't care that you cast out demons. What matters more to me than all of these deeds is our relationship. In verse 23, he said, I never knew you. And the commentaries all tell us that Jesus is using a Jewish idiom which commonly expresses the intimacy that could exist between a husband and a wife. This is deep intimacy that Jesus is speaking about here. It's about a knowing, as when in Genesis we read of the, how the Bible tells us how Adam knew Eve and then she bore a child, an intimate knowledge. And Jesus wants to be known by us. And he wants us to intimately know him. He wants a relationship with us, a very personal relationship with us. This, that's his greatest desire. All the rest is to meant, to be, to be meant to be the fruit of that relationship. But more than anything, he wants a personal relationship with us. And isn't that what we tell people when we try to find out if they know Christ or they're willing to receive him as Savior? We, we, we ask them, you know, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Because that's what he desires. That's why he died on a cross. That's why the power of God raised him from the dead. Now, let's look at Matthew 6, verse 4 for a moment to see how that plays out in a practical way. In Matthew 6, 4, Jesus said, so that your giving may be in secret. Now listen, when you write your tithe check to praise assembly, our treasurer keeps an account so that you can then get a receipt at the end of the year. You can use it to deduct what you've given from your income tax. But please understand that you are not really giving to praise assembly. You're giving to God. And hopefully you're giving and you've decided to give because you love him. That's why we give. We give to those people we love. We give to causes that we appreciate and value and even love. And, and hopefully you don't give to get noticed. Hopefully you don't give out of greed. Hopefully you don't give out of legalism. Hopefully you give because you have a love relationship with the master. You see, Jesus is performing heart surgery in this sermon. He's urging us to examine our motivation. Why do we give? Why do we pray? Why do we fast? What kind of re reward are we looking for? 
Are we looking for a return on our tithe? Do we pray and fast only to get what we want? You see, Jesus wants us to do these things so that we can draw closer to him. You see, the Pharisees emphasize doing, but Jesus seems to be emphasizing being, and specifically being in relationship. And by the way, notice that Jesus, in each instance, he promises a reward from the Father if we will seek to deepen our relationship with him. In Matthew chapter 6, you'll see it in verse 4 and verse 6 and verse 18. Take a look at that again when you get a chance. Matthew 6, verse 4, verse 6, and verse 18. He talks about a reward as we want, as we desire to deepen our relationship with him. We give, we pray, we fast so that we can become more intimate with God. And as we draw closer to him, that is then when we get rewarded. And of course, there's a single verse, there's a single verse in Hebrews that states the same sentiment. In Hebrews 11:6, it reminds us that God rewards those who diligently seek Him. Now notice again, I'm putting all this in context. Hebrews fits quite well with this sixth chapter of Matthew. God rewards those who diligently seek Him. That's a great message. Now, of course, just the opposite is true. I've heard it said that we should beware the barrenness of a busy life, you know, just always doing things. If our lives are all works and only works, then you know what? We're really going to be found, we're going to be found lacking. We're going to be found barren. But a branch attached to Jesus, the vine, is always going to be fruitful. Listen to, listen to John 15, verse 4 and 5. Jesus said, remain in me and I'll remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. And then he says in verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Again, apart from me, you can do nothing. So see how this is speaking about connectedness, speaking about relationship. Okay, so if our righteousness is to surpass that of the Pharisees, then this is how we ought to give with no thought as to how much we should give. We're not to let our left hand know what our right hand is doing. When we pray, forget the showy prayers. Just pray sincerely and as naturally as breathing. When fasting, leave it as an issue between you and God. Don't get legalistic about it. Don't get proud about it, but just do it. And in each of these actions, let your motivation be one of love for the Lord. Bottom line, first thing, the most important thing is let your motivation be one of love for the Lord and do these things because you know that they will draw you closer to him. You see, these are, these are more than Christian disciplines. Giving, praying, fasting, they, they can be Christian disciplines, but they're more than Christian disciplines. These are elements of a relationship that we're supposed to have with our Savior. And I want to close with one final thought. One final thought. In any relationship that we have, we can either just go through the motions, we can work at being a good spouse, a good parent, a good child, friend, whatever the relationship. We can keep the outward responsibility of that relationship. And, and even though we may not feel genuine on the inside, we can keep the outward expression and, of that relationship. And some people will never notice what's going on inside of us. But I think we need to, we need to be concerned about what's taking place on the inside. And imagine how much more rewarding our relationships are when we're fully and sincerely invested with all of our hearts. I want to encourage you to desire more intimate earthly relationships. Again, with your spouse, with, with siblings, with children, with parents, with others. We need to desire intimate relationship with the Lord. And this passage today describes to us how that's something that Jesus desires. More than anything, he wants a deeper relationship with each one of us. That's why he died on the cross, to repair the breach that was brought about by sin. As we pray in a moment, we're to do one thing. We're to ask one question. How is our relationship with Jesus? Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this morning. And although this building is empty, I thank you, Lord, for those who are watching online. And I do pray, God, that what has been shared would be inspirational, but it would also be full of guidance and wisdom, and that it would, in fact, lead to a deeper and more intimate relationship with our Savior. Lord, that we'd 
truly consider this chapter, Matthew chapter 6, and see so clearly what Jesus is concerned about. And that is to diligently desire him more than anything else. And then to simply enjoy the rewards of that relationship. Father, I pray your blessing on everyone watching this presentation this morning, this message. And Lord, I pray that you would keep everyone here, specifically at Praise Assembly, keep us all healthy from the coronavirus, from the flu, from all the other maladies that may be circulating in our community right now. Lord, I pray that you'd also keep our community, our state, our region, all this area at large, that you would keep Keep this virus to the minimum, Lord, that it would pass, it would go away, so that we could enjoy fellowship with one another once again, soon, very soon. Lord God, bless your flock, I pray. Bless Praise Assembly. In Jesus' name, amen.